planet Earth is a super living organism. Since the dawn of time, ancient cultures have understood that every living creature has a spirit, a life force which animates the physical body. Just as every living animal has a spirit, so too does planet Earth. Great scientists such as Sir Isaac Newton and Sir Oliver Lodge recognized the existence of a spiritual domain which surrounds the planet. They called this domain the ether. a vibrational change going on um, within the Earth's energy field and this is affecting weather patterns. It's like a shift and as it shifts of course uh, weather being a, I mean, you've only got to see a thunderstorm, uh, we, we, you can see that weather is just an obvious expression of energy. So if the Earth's energy field is changing in its vibrational state and making a shift then it's going to affect the weather and um, uh, I think that the projections uh, by the global warming uh, um, proponents of, of how things would change um, are already uh, being shown to be um, uh, inaccurate in, the t in terms of the changes happening much quicker. In recent times, an evil group of people who communicate with the spirits of Baphomets and demons have been destroying the very spirit of planet Earth. This global network of black magicians, Satanists, Luciferians and occultists are called the Illuminati. The corporations controlled by the royal, aristocratic and political elite are spraying chemicals into our skies and using secret atmospheric technology to wage war on the planet itself. And there is no doubt whatsoever, indeed the authorities um, have um, uh, admitted it with patents and what have you, that they have weather changing technology. You know, the old uh, Native American rain dances and all this stuff, um, what were they doing? Uh, they were um, performing rituals, dances, sounds that were resonating the energy field and therefore uh, attempting to uh, bring it into a vibrational state in which it manifests as rain. Uh, now technologically, uh, the elite in the underground projects um, have um, this ability. So, uh, and not only uh, in terms of producing uh, weather, but also uh, earthquakes. Um, if you know where on the earth to really give a, uh, a plate a smack then it's going to move and if it moves you've got an earthquake um, and when you look at these hurricanes and I was told when I had my mind-blowing awakening in 1990 that um, we were going to see tsunamis to be honest I, at that time I not even heard the word I said what's a tsunami oh it's a tidal wave massive tidal wave well everyone knows the tsunami is now um, and that we were going to see uh, things like hurricanes on a scale that um, we'd not seen before. Now, when you look at um, the hurricane season in America with Katrina um, and the rest, we're looking at uh, phenomenal storms. And it seems to be very clear that um, if not uh, having the ability to create 
a hurricane from, from, from scratch, if you like, and I think they have, they certainly have the ability to whip them up into much greater uh, uh, catastrophes than um, they would normally. Many people believe that the recent hurricanes and tsunamis have been induced by the use of underground atomic bombs, creating chaos, destruction, and wantonly killing hundreds of thousands of people. The Illuminati are engineering wars and ecological catastrophes, causing millions of people to die in a state of terror, sending shockwaves through the ether as people's spirits cascade into the spirit world. The Illuminati control most of the world's corporations. They are collectively destroying the biodiversity of planet Earth, hurling mankind into a permanent state of fear disconnecting us from the knowledge of our higher spiritual self. The existence of the spirit world and the fact that reality is shaped by our own consciousness is hidden from the public by control of the world's media. Billions of people are dying in ignorance wasting most of their lives hypnotized by television, an invention which was discovered during pioneering research into the spirit world and the ether. Forests, the very lungs of our planet, are being destroyed. The seas are being overfished. Oil, the very blood of the planet, is being sucked dry. The very air which we breathe is being poisoned. Shamans, druids, Sufis, pagans, sadhus, and sky watchers have all recognized for thousands of years that the spirit of planet Earth is central to mankind's survival. This film is about the spiritual life force which is inside all of us and the ether which surrounds our planet. Now, for the first time on film, we explore the evidence of scientists who have studied the nature of spirit and how our spirits, at the time of death of the physical body, reconnect with the larger spirit of planet Earth. Welcome to the secret untold story of the spirit world.
car is on fire and there's no driver at the wheel. And the sewers are all muddied with a thousand lonely suicides. And a dark wind blows. The government is corrupt. And we're on so many drugs with the radio on and the curtains drawn. We're trapped in the belly of this horrible machine. And the machine is bleeding to death. The sun has fallen down. And the billboards are all leering. And the flags are all dead. At the top of their poles. It went like this. The buildings toppled in on themselves. Mothers clutching babies. Picked through the rubble. And pulled out their hair. The skyline was beautiful on fire. All twisted metal stretching upwards. Everything washed in a thin orange haze. I said, kiss me, you're beautiful. These are truly the last days. You grabbed my hand and we fell into it. Like a daydream or a fever. Nine one one was a day when three thousand people had the life force ripped from their physical bodies. It all happened so quickly. No one had prepared for their deaths. In many traditional cultures around the world, family members gather at the bedside and help the spirit of their loved one pass into the spirit world. However, with a violent, unexpected tragedy like 911, it is likely that the spirits of those killed would have stayed at ground zero, lost, possibly forever. When they um, uh, do their terrorist events to blame on someone else, they are very ritualistic in nature in terms of when they're done, where they're done, and um, how they're done. Um, and uh, so, uh, 9/11. I mean, 9/11. What, 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 what do you dial for an emergency in America? Um, 9/11. Yes. Um, and. Um, you find this so often in these um, events that they uh, engineer. Did you, did you know that the Madrid train bombs were exploded 911 days after September the 11th, 2001? Doesn't surprise me, because the thing is that uh, you know, when I started researching this, my buddy jaw was dropping, mm -hmm. not just at the ritualistic and sim symbolic nature of what they did, but the scale and yes. detail of it. Yes. It's almost like a, a, you know, someone's uh, created a computer program to give you the perfect symbolic, ritualistic um, background to, some, to the latest horrific event. Mm. Like something out of the Tower Inferno, like a movie. In, in your book, Alice in Wonderland and the World Trade Center uh, Disaster, you, you actually point out that those twin towers are 
symbolic architectural edifices, which are, I think you compared them to the twin pillars of Freemasonry, Jachin and Boaz. So you've got everything there. You've got like, um, would you say that it was like a mass ritual, a, ma a mass sacrifice? Yes, um, uh, that's what wars are, they're mass sacrifices. Yeah. Um, you know, this shock and awe in Iraq, for instance, um, was there to, um, to have a mass sacrifice. We don't target civilians um, is, is absolute nonsense. Of course they target civilians. They want as many dead people as possible. And of course Iraq, the former land of Sumer and Babylon, um, has enormous significance to these people because they go back to that period and that, uh, that area of, of Babylon, etc., in fact, we, what we're seeing now is global Babylon, when you, when you, you, you look at the symbolism of, of Babylon. Yes. Um, and, and, and for them to kill all those people there, it is a mass ritual sacrifice. say to people is, you know, if you are going to judge what this state of consciousness would do on the basis of what you would do, then you're going to lose the plot from the first because you have a level of compassion. You have a level of empathy. That's the word, empathy, mm. with people who um, suffer the consequences of your actions. That empathy is, is what... Um, balances out your behavior towards someone else because you have empathy with the consequences for them. You remove that empathy and this controlling consciousness has no empathy, mm. not even with itself, never mind uh, its victims and its targets because they are, they are as ruthless with each other as they are with the human race. You take away that empathy and there, is, there are no fail-safe mechanisms um, to um, block um, extreme behavior. Mm -hmm. So, well, the people, the people who run America wouldn't kill 3,000 of their own people. What? They'd have a party! You know, this is not about Americans. Uh, doing it to Americans. This is about this consciousness working through uh, physical forms that uh, appear to be American, um, uh, doing this to what are nothing more uh, to them than humans' perception of cattle. Uh, a situation that uh, started bad just gets worse and worse and worse. The World Trade Center, South Tower, which was hit by a plane and wrecked by an explosion approximately an hour ago, has totally collapsed. Well, it was the day after 911. The major news channels broadcast photographs, uh, still images, from the smoke rising from the Twin Towers. And in the smoke, you could see the faces of demons. Now, I gave a lecture in the south of France, and two brothers came up to me and they said, you know what, the faces of the demons in the smoke at 911 look very similar to a sculpture 
which was done by the philosopher and theosophist Rudolf Steiner. And I took a look at the photograph of uh, the sculpture by Rudolf Steiner. And I have to say, yes, it's, it's very similar to a couple of these so-called demon smoke faces. Now, the name of the sculpture was Araman. Ahriman is one of the facets of Lucifer. And is part of the trinity of Satan. And to see these faces in the smoke coming from the towers at 911, it made me think we're seeing 3,000 people jump to their deaths be suffocated to their deaths, being burnt to death. 3,000 spirits are being ripped from their physical bodies. If you believe in reincarnation, then that means that there must be some kind of catastrophic shockwave going through the spirit world. And this tragedy is magnified by being broadcast to a billion TV screens around the world. Well, um, before I talk about the Ouija board, which I have a, a lot of experience with, I would like to say that under no circumstances do I, I recommend that anyone even <clears throat> remotely experiments with the Ouija board. And the reason for this is because it is, for me, um, the most easiest gateway um, to the spirit world and the Ouija board has been outlawed quite rightly so in many countries around the world but it has a fascinating history and we can't really make a film about the spirit world without actually talking about the Ouija board in the 1700s um, French travellers in North Africa, in uh, Morocco, in a town called Oujda, saw fakirs. Um, these are street performers, they're psychics, they're fortune tellers, they're soothsayers. Using an alphabet scratched out in the ground and using um, entranced snakes, cobras. Um, and what would happen is that the fakir, the word fake, by the way, comes from the word fakir. Uh, the fakir would um, produce a kind of trance-like state in the snake. He would ask questions and the snake would sort of nod its head at various letters scratched on the ground. Um, the French travellers brought back this idea that uh, you could get spirit messages uh, just by pointing at different letters and numbers. Um, they brought it back to Europe, um, it then made its way over to America and believe it or not, Ouija boards were 
marketed as a novelty um, by various games manufacturers in America, and they corrupted the name of the town in Morocco, uh, which was originally Oujda, which is on the northern coast of Morocco. Um, it became known as Oasia, and um, eventually then it became known as the Talking Board. There have been a lot of bad cases of people receiving really messages from bad spirits via the Ouija board. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing is you don't even need a Ouija board to use the same system. You can go out and buy a box of Scrabble and you can lay out an alphabet and uh, the numbers from 0, uh, 1, 2, 3, up, uh, up to 9 hello, goodbye, and uh, you can um, just ask, is there a spirit in this house? Now, a spirit usually does come through, and if you're using an upturned glass, which is the most common way of getting the message from the spirit to, to spell out words, the force and the speed and the preciseness of the movements of that glass can be really quite astounding. I've seen the top layer of varnish removed in less than an hour from a wooden table um, by the force of uh, the spirits moving that glass. Um, now you know, this is very, very dangerous because the Ouija board is totally unlike ceremonial magic. In a magical ritual, um, you would entice, invoke a particular spirit. Uh, with Ouija, you just ask, is there a spirit in the house? And bang, usually the glass starts moving straight away. Now, um, here's a message for everyone who is involved in the so-called New Age. Just because you have a discarnate spirit speaking to you through the Ouija board, that does not automatically imply that that spirit has good intentions. In actual fact, spirits lie and cheat and are mischievous exactly the same as people are. A typical example is um, where a spirit of a famous bad person, um, the favourite would be, say for example, Hitler, or a mass murderer like Stalin, and that would come through, spell its name out and start giving you information. Of course, a chill goes around the room. Um, you know, spirits lie, people lie, spirits are, you know, really basically a continuation of the personality of the person. Therefore, I would say never ever use this um, system. Um, there are colleges where you can go to learn to be a medium and I would never ever dabble in any communication with the spirit world unless you have been uh, properly trained.
Nane Buddha, Kleina, Zemli, Kruh, Nas, Svak, Dani, Daj, Nam, Dana, Svi, Otpusti, Nam, Duge, Naši, Kakli, Mi, Otpušta, Modužnicima, Naši, Ne, Uvedi, Nas, U, Napad, Svi, Izbaj, Nas, Odlame, Slava, Otcu, I, Sinu, I, Duhu, I, Sveto, Kako bi, Aše, Na, Početku, Tako, I, Sada, I, Vata, Vijek, Vijek, Ovame, In 1981, at Medjugorje in Bosnia, a ghostly apparition appeared to a group of six peasant children. The children would pray in a trance-like state and stare upwards, and the apparition would give them telepathic messages. Some of the children believed they were in the presence of the spirit of Mary the fabled mother of Jesus. During the 1980s, news of this persistent apparition soon spread and literally millions of people began to visit Medjugorje in Bosnia. The huge crowds of pilgrims who gathered at Medjugorje, more than 30 million over a period of three years, were never shown on television. The mainstream media never fully reported the persistent apparition in Medjugorje. Soon after, the country of Bosnia, part of the former Yugoslavia, was bombed into oblivion by the US and British governments. The entire country was transformed into a war zone, and the telepathic communication between the children and spirit of the Virgin Mary was violently disrupted. At Fatima in Portugal, Lourdes in France, and at San Sebastian de Garambandal in Spain, Millions of people regularly witness paranormal apparitions, but it is never reported on the mainstream media. I've looked at many, many different ghost videos uh, in the research for this film, and obviously there are many fakes. It's a pretty normal story. Um, people in this building had heard uh, the voice of a young girl, and somebody had briefly seen a very faint apparition of a young girl walking around in the corner of this empty room. And so the story behind this video is that a person gets their camcorder. They go up there and sure enough, you can very, very faintly see the outline of a young girl. If you don't like ghosts, then hide behind the sofa for the next few seconds.
ghost of the young girl is what's known as a persistent apparition. And these are particularly scary because in the movies, uh, you know, perhaps we're all brought up to, you know, to be told that if you see a ghost, don't worry, just uh, switch on the lights, clap your hands, make a la loud sound, and the ghost will go away. Well, um, that is, I would say, uh, truthful for m most uh, sightings of uh, apparitions and ghosts. However, um, there is a phenomenon and that is known as a persistent apparition. And a persistent apparition is particularly scary because you may clap your hands, you may switch the light on, you may uh, make a, a sudden gesture and the ghost doesn't go away. <laughs> Psychic and spiritual phenomena have occurred throughout the history of mankind, often touching the lives of learned people and peasants alike. Socrates and Joan of Arc both heard spirit voices, which prophesied events to come. The Old and New Testaments of the Holy Bible are brimful of psychic and spiritual phenomena. The character we have come to know as Jesus of Nazareth was said to be able to see and talk to spirits which had possessed the bodies of the living. The ability to prophesy future events by receiving telepathic messages from spirits has played a central role in all of the world's great religions. Psychokinetic activity, such as the ability to levitate and move objects with the power of the mind, is closely linked with many of the great saints. Saint Joseph of Copertino was beautified as a saint by the Vatican in 1753. Vatican records show that St. Joseph was able to levitate and was witnessed flying around by Pope Urban VIII himself. Trinity College, Cambridge has for centuries been a British center of occultism esoteric science and espionage. Students and professors of this bastion of British society have been deeply involved in magic, spiritualism and spying. The notorious part-time spy and black magician Alastair Crowley attended Trinity College and went on to lead the infamous secret society called the Golden Dawn. Scientific investigation of the spirit world and psychic abilities had been conducted throughout the medieval era. Its focal point became Trinity College at Cambridge University. Since the 1400s, Trinity College has been a hotbed of occultism and espionage, the two dark worlds often overlapping throughout the history of Trinity College. Dr. John Dee was an Elizabethan magician who used a polished piece of obsidian rock called a dark mirror to communicate with angelic spirits. These spirits dictated to John Dee a system known as Enochian magic. 
The Enochian system describes the spirit world and gives instruction on how to communicate with spirits of angels and demons. A Victorian secret society called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn were to later take the Enochian system of spirit communication and combine it with the use of the so-called dark mirror used by magicians in ancient Egypt. During the Elizabethan era, Dr. John Dee was not only the pioneer of Enochian magic, but also a personal spy to Queen Elizabeth I. Dee studied at Trinity College, Cambridge. Dee was to be followed within the halls of Trinity College by other magicians, alchemists, occultists, and spiritualists. Sir Isaac Newton also attended Trinity College, Cambridge, where he wrote many articles about a spiritual domain referred to by Christians as heaven, which Newton and other scientists called the ether. The leading scientists of the day believed that a domain of spiritual psychic energy which permeates all matter exists in the universe. A dense, concentrated area orbits planet Earth just above the atmosphere. This became known as the psychic ether. The existence of the ether, which is where spirits of dead people live, was well known to Dr. John Dee, Sir Isaac Newton, and the scientists who followed in their footsteps. In 1909, Sir Oliver Lodge wrote The Ether of Space, a companion to his equally groundbreaking book about the spirit world called The Survival of Man. These early scientists taught that no element could exist without having some form of relationship to the ether. The ether was the domain of spirit and the realm from which magicians and psychics such as the French doctor Nostradamus received their information. Following in the footsteps of John Dee, British occultist, the self-styled Beast 666, Mr. Alistair Crowley, who would go on to be a part-time spy for MI5, attended Trinity College in the late 1800s. Whilst Crowley was a student at Trinity College, three Trinity Dons decided to found a society to investigate the spirit world. In 1882, Edmund Gurney, Frederick William Henry Myers, 
and Henry Sidgwick founded the Society for Psychical Research, otherwise known as the SPR. For the next 100 years, two groups, the Golden Dawn and the SPR, would invest thousands of hours of research and fortunes into the spirit world. On the one hand, members of the Golden Dawn would use Dr. John Dee's system of ancient Enochian magic to invoke and communicate with spirits of angels and demons. And on the other hand, the SPR would finance thousands of seances, inviting spirits to manifest and speak with the living. Just six years after the founding of the SPR, Britain's most famous and powerful magical secret society was formed in London. The Isis Urania, Temple of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, was established on March the 1st, 1888. Its founders, Dr. William Robert Woodman, William Wynne Westcott, and Samuel Little McGregor Mathers, were all Rosicrucian Freemasons. The Golden Dawn was a depository of occult knowledge. Alistair Crowley joined after attending Trinity College. Other members included W.B. Yeats and the author of Dracula, Mr. Bram Stoker. The Golden Dawn invoked spirits using magical techniques taken from Dr. John Dee's Enochian system of magic and became the main magical secret society for British aristocrats and royalty. The Golden Dawn was heavily influenced by the writings of Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who would later be outed as a fraudulent psychic by members of the Society for Psychical Research. Rituals using the so-called Dark Mirror were performed at Golden Dawn ceremonies on a regular basis. The Dark Mirror is a piece of polished black obsidian rock which is placed inside the magic circle. It is used rather like a crystal ball. The magician watches the reflection of his own face whilst invoking or calling a spirit. Etched into the surface of the dark mirror is an ancient Enochian or Kabbalistic design which helps mesmerize the eyes of the magician and enter a hypnotic trance. The magician's reflection would morph into the face of a spirit which would then telepathically communicate with the magician. with the magician. Adajita Rupa Ate Zodo Nugo Nupa Ite Salada Vi E Ro El The Bamayata Regi is of the Rosazod he adapte tati rema abrimaji patalado alakalada tosha lorikel ko tari besa oje balatohe yui tai tali sada oeri od nikala tate tahi sadia ozo dolu dolu Lape no enu tarote koreta tadeo pro maninu.
Alistair Crowley used opium as part of his daily diet in order to free himself from everyday life and to communicate with spirits. Crowley was copying the traditions of magicians and shamans who have inhabited all continents of planet Earth since the dawn of man. Shamans in Australasia, Arabia, Siberia, the Orient, South and North America have perfected a natural science of spirit communication using a wide range of hallucinogenic plants which grow in deserts, forests and even in mountains. According to Mexican shamans, the so-called hallucinogenic experience is really just the opening of a gateway to the world of unseen spirit. Thousands of years, shamans all over the planet connected themselves with the spirits of their ancestors, the spirits of plants, the spirit of planet Earth itself, and the spirit of the universe. Shamans achieved this by using herbs, roots, cacti, vines, saps, and fungi. To the uninitiated, the effect of the so-called plants of the gods seems unreal, fantastic, or even frightening, and is often described as hallucinogenic or psychedelic. Many people say they are scared of ever experiencing the effects of these ancient plants. American author Carlos Castaneda says that this is because our modern lifestyles have become controlled by the corporate Illuminati and are now disconnected with the spirits of nature and the spirit of planet Earth. Shamans across the planet teach their children that ancient herbs such as ayahuasca reconnect your astral body with the infinite spirit of planet Earth. Many of the plants used by shamans to open the gateway to the spirit world contain a substance called dimethyltryptamine, or DMT for short. Dimethyltryptamine has been described as the spirit molecule because it appears in hallucinogenic plants and also naturally occurs in the human brain. The effects of DMT often create a so-called out-of-body experience, where the spirit body or astral body can leave the physical body and explore the universe. Maite wawi dada, vuse shanshe tu kito ka api.
Daha. Era mi Luigi. It is this experience which shamans for thousands of years have taught their children to experience. For DMT creates not only a sensation of physical liberation, but also spiritual liberation. Through the use of plants which contain DMT, shamans teach that you can once again develop a strong relationship with the spirit world. The most abundant supply of plants containing DMT are in the rainforests of South America. Is this why the Illuminati corporations are destroying the rainforests. This ancient relationship between your soul or spirit and the powerful manifestations of earth spirits has been suppressed by modern city dwelling lifestyles and watching too much television. Olympia. This is direct television from the studios of Alexander Pat. The battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Yesterday, Upon it depends our own British December life. 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Men will still say, this but they're Sir William Crookes was a highly respected physicist in the Victorian era. Crookes not only attended dark mirror rituals at the Golden Dawn, but was also a leading member of the Society for Psychical Research. Sir William Crookes 
had invented several devices which could measure the existence of tiny elementary particles, such as electrons. Sir William Crookes believed that spirits in the ether were capable of moving small primary particles such as electrons and protons. William Crookes developed the cathode ray tube, the most important element to a modern television. Firing billions of electrons at a glass screen covered in phosphorus. These pioneering experiments produced amorphous, fuzzy speckles on a glass screen. By staring at the cathode ray tube image, Crookes realized that spirits might somehow be invoked to arrange these particles into an image of the spirit world. Crookes experimented with the cathode ray tube and placed a Maltese cross inside it and bombarded it with streams of electrons. The Maltese cross is an ancient emblem used by magicians, Kabbalists, royal Satanists, Nazis and the infamous American Phi Beta Kappa secret society. Crookes managed to project a shadowy image at the other end of the cathode ray tube, which was the first ever electrically created image known to man. In his memoirs, Sir William Crookes said that it might be possible for spirits to influence streams of tiny particles. Sir William Crookes would go on to become president of the Society for Psychical Research and inspired Sir Oliver Lodge's research into the ether and the spirit world. The Crookes version of the cathode ray tube would become the most fundamental component in the development of television devised 40 years later by the Scotsman John Logie Baird. Television, an invention which would eventually enslave and hypnotize the entire world, was inspired in part by research into the spirit world.
my research into uh, these lost spirits, that's what a mojo is, um, started about five years ago. I was in the north of England in Stourbridge. And I was giving a talk. And, you know, normally uh, what happens is after a talk, you know, quite a lot of people come down to the front of the stage and uh, a lot of the time people bring things and it's very nice of them and they, they bring me photographs and they bring me audio recordings and other pieces of evidence and uh, I, I've managed to, to collate a, a big library of material from different people. And this chap came up to me and he had a, a large envelope. Um, these photos that he had in the envelope were they were bigger than 8 by 10 they were they were really big and he said to me he, he said uh, do you want to see a photograph of a spirit and i said well yeah i'm very interested in this type of thing so he pulled out the first photograph and i thought well you know this guy's paid a lot of money to have these huge photographs printed and i thought you know this is going to be something special and the first photograph is just of a door you see, it's a closed door, uh, just with a blank wall. And he, says, he, he said to me, he said, can you see the spirit? <laughs> and I said, oh, no, I, uh, I can't see the spirit in that photo. It's just a door. And he said to me, he said, you, you look closer. Uh, and I did look closer, and he he pointed to what looked like a crack, um, a black crack between the wooden surround of the door and the plaster on the wall. And it was at the top of the door frame. So that then he got the second photograph out and that was like a, a side-on, sort of pretty close-up view of this black crack. Now, it just looked like a crack, okay? And he said to me, this is a lost spirit. And it's in this room, and they hear murmurings, and they hear talk, talking. And this alerted this guy, and he staked out the room, and he realized that the spirit was dormant, and it was taking on the shape of this thing that looked like a black crack of the door so I thought well that sounds really strange I'd never heard of anything like this before and then he showed me the third photograph and you could clearly see then that yes it did look like a crack for most of its length and then you could see that uh, part of this blackness was sort of overlapping the edge of the actual door frame as if it was drooping slightly and he said to me, he said, that, that is a rare photograph. He said, uh, I call these mojos. And he goes, they're everywhere. And then he showed me another photograph, and, and you could see that this thing had moved. And it, it sort of moved along the top edge of the wooden frame of the door, and part of it wasn't sort of in contact with the wall anymore. And you could actually see the join between the piece of wood that made up the top of the surround of the door frame and the wall. And I said to him, you know, I'd never come across this kind of thing before. And um, is it still there? And he said, yes, it's, it's still there, but he tries not to pass underneath the door. And I said to him, why? You know, what, what, what would happen? And he said that these lost spirits um, hang around on the tops of door frames waiting for somebody to walk through because what they want is they want somebody who's under a lot of kind of stress or somebody who's under the influence of alcohol somebody who's under the influence of drugs to walk through and then this mojo would actually drop from the uh, door frame and it go head first and enter that person's aura or their astral body through what he said was their crown chakra. So uh, 
you know, I wish I had taken copies of these photographs because I realised um, after I started researching the existence of these lost spirits, these mojos, whatever you want to call them, that uh, photographs like this are extremely rare. And if this gentleman sees uh, this film, I'd like him to send me copies of those photos. Now, what is a mojo? Where on earth do these things come from? Well, um, you know the song Eleanor Rigby? Uh, all those lonely people, where do they all come from? Over the years uh, that I've dedicated into researching the spirit world, I've realized that many people die lonely. And they die lonely mainly because they've built barriers built walls between themselves and other people through bigotry, arrogance. Um, they've lived out of their lower self. Now, what's the difference between the lower self and the higher self? Well, the higher self would be a person who tries always to think of the effects, the effect that they're having on other people and try and be compassionate and polite and to try and be good as much as possible and to try and live in harmony with nature and always to be mindful of causing any kind of tension or stress with other people, trying to avoid that. And that would be somebody who's trying to live out their higher self. Unfortunately, millions, if not billions, of people die, um, and they've lived their lives in their lower self. They have not bothered to read, they've not bothered to research anything about the death experience, even though they must have known that death was inevitable. And these people have died lonely and they have not fulfilled the dreams that they might have had when they were children. And therefore, their spirit finds it extremely difficult to separate from their physical body, but nonetheless they do separate. And because they really shielded themselves from any kind of spiritual uh, thought, they just allowed themselves to be force-fed by television. And television doesn't have really any serious spiritual information on it whatsoever. The spirits of these people hang around because they think, well, the game is not yet over. You know... Um, the spirit is free of the physical body, which in most cases would have been in pretty bad health. And so they discover this new form of freedom as a spirit. However, they realize that um, they're imprisoned in some way because they have no idea of how to move on, go to a higher spiritual plane. And so what they do is they take up residence in places which don't have too much movement of people. Um, they prefer dusty, unclean rooms. And like this man said, they take up residence on door frames. And this is a very common thing. And you, you'll find that there are millions, if not billions of lost mojo spirits, whatever you want to call them, in every city uh, around the world. The Freemasons and the Templars who designed and built the great medieval cathedrals 
and also all of the architects and designers of all of the churches, must have been fully aware that Mojo's liked to take up residence on the flat um, part of the door frame because um, nearly every single church and cathedral in the world has windows and doors which are, which are shaped like that. And the reason that, uh, that, that they're shaped like that is so that the mojo just sort of slides off and cannot actually get a grip on a doorway which is shaped like that. <laughs> Now, in some cultures, these mojo spirits are called sliverers or slivering. Now, where have we heard slithering before? Well, we see it in Harry Potter. SBR's membership included many leading scientists of the day who spent fortunes studying people who had psychic abilities. These psychic people claimed they could bridge the gap between the living physical world and the spirit world and as such were called mediums. sometimes allowed their bodies to be entirely possessed, albeit temporarily, by spirits who would then speak through the medium. On rare occasions, physical manifestations of an eerie white substance called ectoplasm was seen emerging from the body of the medium and forming the shape of hands, faces, and, in particularly rare cases, the entire body of a deceased person's spirit. During the 1860s, scientific investigation of these so-called mediums involved the eminent scientist Sir William Crookes the man who had seen the faces of spirits appear in the dark mirror during rituals at the Golden Dawn and who had first demonstrated publicly that images could be created electronically using the cathode ray tube. In France, a huge modern spiritualist movement began in the 19th century with the birth of Leon Denizard Reveil, who was born in Lyon in 1804. Reveil was at first skeptical of the reports of French explorers who had witnessed shamans in Siberia and Canada drumming up the spirits of their ancestors. In 1855, a friend invited Reveil to a seance where spirits made themselves manifest in front of the sitters. The table also levitated and turned. Reveil underwent an evangelical conversion to spiritualism. Reveil was instructed by the spirits to change his name. He became known as Alan Kardec. His experiences and conversations were written down in a book called The Book of Spirits. Alan Kardec claimed that there were two independent worlds, one visible and the other invisible. Kardec said that the spiritual life force is formed of quintessential matter which is united to the physical body by a so-called astral body. Kardec taught reincarnation as a matter of fact.
he told all his followers that there is no death. In fact, according to Alan Kardec, there are no dead people. Everyone who has died discovers the reality of the spirit world. Alan Kardec also taught the law of karma as a matter of fact. That is, if you lead your life doing bad things, being lazy or self-centered, or leading an indulgent non-spiritual life, then your spirit will suffer the consequences after the death of your physical body. Alan Kardec also taught that just before the time of the death of the physical body, each person is replayed a movie of all the things that they have seen and done in their previous life. Well, uh, to be absolutely honest, I don't think it's a very rare thing to uh, be walking around with these mojos inside us. I, I see, you know, most people at one time or another, you know, acting outside their personality. And <coughs> the thing about a mojo is that it's desperate to re-experience uh, the phys physical body. I mean, mojos... Um, want to cling on to the physical plane and the reason they want to stay here is because they want to experience strong emotions um, they want to experience sex they want to experience uh, any kind of strong emotion to give them if you like some kind of sustenance and some kind of form of entertainment there is nothing else for them to do most of us are of a good disposition and it's very difficult for these things to actually get a grip on us. However, um, there is uh, an interesting photograph from Australia of these two childlike hands gripping onto a man while he's uh, getting drunk. He's having a good old drink. And alcohol, uh, many psychics have told me, is uh, one of these drugs which really, really oils the wheels, if you like, and allows uh, people to uh, drop down into their lower self and uh, they find themselves, you know, uh, pub crawling in these uh, dirty old watering holes, uh, bad bars and this kind of thing. And in cities, uh, there's an infestation of these lost souls. And uh, it's when somebody is inebriated that uh, you can often get a, a really bad situation where not only one, but uh, maybe two, maybe three of these mojos have uh, dropped their way into the person's chakra system, whatever you want to call it. What unfolds then is uh, sometimes a pretty serious story. Uh, it can get to the point where we have multiple personalities within one person. And uh, you can have a situation where the mojos are competing for, you know, the person's waking hours. And the mojos can speak uh, directly 
to that person and people can, you know, start to think that they're going mad. If we then look at very extreme cases where a mojo has maybe been resident in somebody for you know 20 or 30 years that mojo um, takes the path of least resistance in terms of its manipulation of physical matter ideally that mojo wants its own body again it's a lost spirit it did have a body at one time and its main goal is it wants to have another body and <clears throat> what can happen is that um, small organisms in the body and the smallest organisms that we find in the human body are viruses and bacteria you can have a situation where these bacterial cells in the gut are manipulated and uh, shamans in uh, South America who do what is known as psychic surgery claim to be able to cut out of people's abdomens these worm-like structures um, and these are uh, objects that have been sort of knitted or woven together using bile, uh, detritus, bacteria and uh, uh, plaque uh, in the digestive system. These uh, shaman doctors, they say that uh, these worm-like structures, which have been photographed on a few occasions, are the result of the mojo working inside somebody's body uh, to try and create a physical uh, body for the mojo to live in. This research led me on to look at teratoma tumors which are terrifying. A teratoma tumor um, when it's cut out of a human body is usually pretty large. Um, these things can be uh, sometimes the size of a football. And a teratoma tumour uh, can be a terrifying object. Uh, people are absolutely shocked. Cannot believe that this thing was inside them because many times teratoma tumours, they have hair, they have eyes, um, they have nasal passages and sometimes noses, and they have mouths with teeth. And I believe that what's happened here is that a mojo spirit has had many years inside the person's body to manipulate uh, small groups of cells and has hijacked really the genetic blueprint of uh, the genome and over a very long period of time has attempted to build a body for itself. In 1905, Charles Richer was conducting experiments into the mysterious substance known as ectoplasm. Witnesses at seances often saw ectoplasm float in space, taking the form of hands. These ghostly ectoplasmic hands would then float about the room, picking up small objects such as thimbles and placing them on the hands of sitters during seances. Writing in 1921, British scientist Sir Oliver Lodge, the pioneer of radio, commented on the research into ectoplasm conducted by Baron von Schrenk Notzing, who had taken extensive amounts of photographs of ectoplasm seeping through the clothes of a medium 
called Eva C. According to Oliver Lodge, ectoplasm sometimes took on a semi-luminous appearance and was able to form an almost perfect three-dimensional replica of a full-bodied living person. Ectoplasmic hands were seen clutching the legs, arms, and hands of sitters, just as William Crookes had witnessed and photographed during his seances with British medium Florence Cook. Incredible as it sounds, wax impressions were taken of these ectoplasmic hands, which show real fingerprints. This phenomena was witnessed by John Logie Baird, the Scotsman who took William Crookes's cathode ray tube and combined it with the pioneering research of Sir Oliver Lodge. John Logie Baird used ultra-high frequency or UHF waves to transmit invisible sound and pictures through the air at a frequency so high some said it would affect the spirits who lived in the ether. In the mid-1920s John Logie Baird also invented Noctovision which was a form of television which could record images in total darkness using infrared rays. In 1926, Sir Oliver Lodge and his daughter visited Baird's laboratory and was extremely impressed by this new invention. John Logie Baird's noctovision would lead him to become involved with experiments into the spirit world. One day in 1927, a professor from a Scottish university visited Baird's laboratory and asked if it was possible to use noctovision equipment to record ectoplasm and spirits at a seance. According to John Logie Baird's own memoirs published by the Royal Television Society, Baird immediately agreed to take part in a seance, which was conducted by a medium called Marjorie. Ten years before, the young son of Marjorie had committed suicide, slicing his own throat with a razor. The police had encased the blood-stained razor complete with fingerprints in a glass case. After her son's suicide, Marjorie was heartbroken and joined a spiritualist church in order to make contact with her dead son's spirit. During a seance, she fell into a trance and ectoplasm began to exude from her body, which formed a solid hand. Spirits told her that this hand was the hand of her own dead son.
the Scottish professor from Glasgow University leading the investigation into Marjorie, told John Logie Baird that he had made a wax impression of the thumbprint of this ectoplasmic hand during one of the seances. The professor compared the wax fingerprint from the spirit hand with a thumbprint on the razor, which Marjorie's son had used to commit suicide. To John Logie Baird's amazement, the two fingerprints were absolutely identical. This would not be the end of John Logie Baird's extensive involvement in the spirit world. Not long after this incident, the ghost of none other than Thomas Alva Edison, the inventor of the audio phonograph, contacted Baird at a seance. The spirit of Edison tapped out a message in Morse code and told Baird that his noctovision system would enable the living to speak with the dead. Hello? Well, it's a bit of a long story. A good friend of mine is a computer programmer, and they've got very, very good long-term experience of these uh, really very, very large computer systems that you would find you know, in insurance companies and oil companies. Uh, these are so-called mainframe computers which uh, take up an entire office or take up an entire floor and have to be especially air-conditioned, this kind of thing. They use very strange languages. And he told me about a phenomenon called emergent behaviour. This is where big computer systems, big telephone networks are doing things that nobody ever told them to do. For example, programs would run on their own, messages would appear on computer screens which nobody typed. As far as telephones are concerned, um, it would take the form of telephone calls to people, and there wouldn't be anybody else at the other end of the line. There's also a phenomenon known as the phantom fax, and this is where messages are being handwritten, usually in some kind of old-fashioned writing, and are being signed, in some cases, by famous people who died a long time ago. And there are several people around the world who are presently receiving faxes, handwritten faxes, from the spirit of Jules Verne, the famous uh, French science fiction writer who's been dead many, many years. I became very, very interested in this emergent behavior because I had a feeling that it wasn't just due to errors in the system. I had followed the research of Sir William Crookes and Sir Oliver Lodge, and they were each pioneers of things like cathode ray tubes and radio waves. And I had come to the conclusion that many of the scientists in the 1900s were of the disposition that spirits could influence very, very tiny particles, such as electrons or photons. And when I heard about emergent behaviour, I immediately thought, could this be an example where a spirit is not strong enough to move a physical object? A spirit is not usually strong enough to pick up the receiver on a telephone and move the dial. 
But could this be, this emergent behavior phenomenon, could it be a symptom of spirits trying to shift electrons down wires? Costume does. Granny? Who are you? No, uh uh, I don't remember. What? Hello, little one. <gasps> I am your friend. <gasps> we want the angel. Well, Phone Calls from the Dead is a, you know, it's a fascinating book. Um, there's dozens of cases in this book that have been collected by the authors. And we have transcripts of conversations. And the, the conversations are very, very touching. These are usually phone calls which are made within minutes or within a couple of hours of the death of someone. And a uh, typical example is where a son or a daughter receives a phone call from their parent. And the parent says, uh, are you okay? And the daughter or the son says, yeah, I'm fine. We'll come over and visit you. And the parent might say, well, no, I'll come and visit you. I love you. And uh, these calls are touching and brief. And then the reality dawns that that phone call was made. Sometimes the spirits even leave messages on answer phone machines, which record the exact time of that call. And in many cases, that person had died previously that actual day. According to documents and memoirs held in the archives of the Edison Company of the United States, American genius Thomas Alva Edison, who invented the electric light bulb, the phonograph record player, and the movie cine camera, designed a machine in the 1920s which could be used to communicate with the spirits of dead people. Unfortunately, Thomas Edison passed away before his invention was complete. Several years later, at a seance attended by John Logie Baird in London, the spirit of Thomas Edison tapped out a message using Morse code. This eerie experience was recorded in John Logie Baird's autobiography, published by the Royal Television Society. The message from the spirit of the dead Thomas Edison told John Logie Baird 
that Edison was working on his own version of Noctovision, the infrared television system which could record images in the dark. The spirit of Edison told Baird that he had assembled a team of scientists in the spirit world who were working together to help living people speak with their dead relatives. On the earth. 